to call to order the June 18th beginning of the budget hearings. If we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Leopold? Here. Kunitri? Here. Caput? Here. McPherson? Here. Chair Friend? Here. If you could join us in a moment of silence on the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning, Mr. Palacios. Are there any changes to today's agenda? Uh, yes, there are a couple of changes in the introductory items. Uh, number four, uh, there's a correction. The item should read, Budget Overview 2018-19 Proposed County Budget, Remarks by the County Administrative Officer, Remarks by the Auditor, Controller, Treasurer, Tax Collector, and then Public Testimony on the Proposed Budget. Uh, presentation on the General Government Budget Category as provided in the Proposed Budget, pages 35 through 37. And then on the Consent Agenda, item number 20, there's a correction, the item should read, direct staff to return on June 26, 2018 for last day budget hearings with any final adjustments. Thank you. We actually start off with you in the budget overview. I've noticed that your entire staff is only sitting on one side of the building, so maybe, uh, maybe they know, okay. Good morning, uh, Chair Friend and members of the board. Uh, your session this morning opens the 2018-19 budget hearings. Uh, the documents before you today include the CAO's proposed budget, which includes the accounting item detail. In addition, you have before you the supplemental budget, which provides additional financial actions reports, the unified fee schedule, and the continuing agreements list. Our office will be presenting any last day reports including a financial update and concluding actions prior to the close of budget hearings on June 26th. And uh, just noting that all of the budget documents are posted on the County of Santa Cruz uh, update. Over the next week, the board will consider recommendations from our office on the 2018-19 county budget. County department heads will present information on their programs and members of the public will address you about the impacts of the budget on a wide range of community needs. We believe our work to date represents a key number of successes that respond to your priorities and that this budget builds on that momentum. You will hear more about these successes as each department presents their budget throughout the week. When I began this job, I outlined a uh, three-year work plan that included um, in the first year development of a strategic plan, um, including um, strong fiscal management and stewardship, continuing our tradition of that, and as well as augmenting services in some key areas. Um, in addition, as I'll say later, the second year includes an operations plan, which is meant to have key programs and objectives to carry out the strategic plan, and that will be a two-year document that will be linked to a two-year budget. And so um, the strategic plan, which is a six-year um, document, will be linked to the budget via the operations plan, which we, we will be developing in the coming year. So in terms of uh, that strategic plan, you can see that we have completed um, or are almost complete. You had the strategic plan presentation um, last week and we will be adopting it next week. Um, next fiscal year, we'll be developing operation plans um, that will be countywide uh, by department. Uh, this will be linked to a two-year budget. And uh, meanwhile, during uh, the next fiscal year, we will be developing continuous process improvement projects and performance measures as well. Um, I know that 
there's a lot of um, anticipation of a lot of these projects and they do take time though. It is a complicated thing and we will be doing um, continuous process improvement um, pilot projects through this fiscal year and also doing a lot of staff training about performance measures. It's a very complicated area. Performance measurement is something um, I know the grand jury pointed out in their um, report on our budget. Uh, it's something really that very few people do well. It's a very difficult area. There are some examples uh, across the country, but there's not many. And so we will be breaking new ground uh, as we do, as we implement performance measures to tie our performance uh, to our strategic plan. And w this next year we will be especially spending a lot of time with some pilot projects as well as a lot of staff training in that area. Um, fiscal stewardship. This is something uh, that the board has made a priority and as well as uh, your county administrative office. And this is something that we should be proud of. We have had great success in managing uh, the county um, budget. And at a time when um, other jurisdictions um, near us have had to declare fiscal emergencies, when others have actually had to go to major layoffs um, in neighboring just jurisdictions, uh, we have a balanced budget with no layoffs, and uh, that's due to uh, this board's um, very um, thoughtful um, and careful management of the, of the county's budget. Uh, so to start with, we have uh, tripled our reserves, which I know our, our auditor controller, treasurer, tax collector will go into more detail about, but this is something that you set out as a goal in 2014 to get up to 10%. Um, we have, um, we've achieved that three years ahead of schedule. You gave us a deadline of 2021 and we achieved it um, this last fiscal year. So three years ahead of schedule, uh, we've tripled our reserves and reached your goal of 10%, which is um, a very good thing to have um, com accomplished behind us and we need to maintain that in the future. We've also uh, improved our credit rating uh, because of your strong fiscal management. Um, no, in November of 2017, S&P Global Ratings uh, upped our, increased our um, rating to AA plus, uh, which is equivalent uh, if it were to have been for a GAO bond to a AAA rating. And in their comments, they noted that we have a very strong local economy, but they also noted that we have a strong county management with good financial policies and practices we have very strong budgetary performance with balanced operating results in the general fund and at the go total governmental fund level. Strong budgetary flexibility with uh, healthy fund balance, very strong liquidity, and very strong uh, debt um, management. In fact, our debt um, is very, it's very interesting, it our debt service represents less than 2% of our expenditures, which is very conservative, uh, and um, two-thirds of our debt is gonna be retired within 10 years. So you've been very careful in managing our debt, and that has led to a very strong rating, and also um, to the fact that we have flexibility if we ever needed to issue debt in the future. Uh, we've reduced pension obligations. Uh, this is something that the board has done over a number of years. In 2007, um, re regarding retire, retiree health benefits, um, in conjunction with our labor partners, uh, we negotiated the implementation of a cafeteria plan and a cap on retiree health benefits. This action reduced uh, the unfunded actuarial accrued liability for our retiree health plan by $35 million. And then in 2012, uh, the county, again with our labor partners, implemented a retiree health longevity schedule that links the level of benefits to years of service and age at retirement. Uh, these reforms reduced uh, the unfunded liability by an additional 54 million. So those two actions that this board took uh, in conjunction with our labor partners uh, reduced our liability for retiree health benefits by almost $90 million which is a very significant achievement. With regard to retiree uh, benefits, uh, you've also been proactive. In 2012, 
the county uh, implemented a tier, a second tier for PERS retirement for all employee groups. Uh, this again was done in partnership with our labor partners to increase the viability and sustainability of our retirement system. This is something we did ahead of the state. The state later and uh, a year later implemented retiree um, reforms, but we did it before them. Uh, this incre increased the retirement age, reduced the benefit formula, increased employee participation. Uh, this change uh, was estimated at the time to have reduced retirement costs by $93 million over 30 years. Uh, 2013, uh, the following year, the state implemented um, Public Employees Pension Reform Act, or PEPRA, and this again uh, reduced, uh, increased the retirement age and uh, changed the benefit formulas and increased employee contributions. And this also will have uh, an effect, a significant event, significant effect over time to make the pension system uh, sustainable and more viable. Uh, we have uh, controlled employee growth. In the um, recession of 2008, uh, we actually reduced our employee base by 15%. Um, and we went down um, to a low of almost 2,300 employees. Uh, we're now at 2,470 employees. Uh, we're still almost 10% uh, less employees than we were at the, uh, before the recession. So even today, we're almost 10% less. And so we have had uh, some modest growth. We only have 2,470 employees versus 2,700 in 2008. So, um, sig significantly less employees. And this is despite significant growth in our health and human services staff, especially due to the Affordable Care Act. So what that means is that in our general government sectors, we have not grown. We have maintained the losses that we suffered during the recession. So even today, we're almost 10% less employees than we were uh, in 2008 during the recession. And then uh, we've made some inroads on deferred maintenance, which is a significant uh, problem that all local governments face. Uh, we stopped, as everybody else did, investing in some of our routine maintenance of our facilities, and we are no, we're starting in this budget to try and catch up on that. Uh, despite your very conservative fiscal management, we've actually um, augmented some services. And so uh, these programs include the Nurse Family Partnership, Thrive by Three, Whole Person Care, and Medi-Cal Drug Expansion. Um, we've also responded to the needs of the homeless by expanding our shelter and working to alleviate homelessness among our youth. Uh, we've also made significant investments in new facilities and in public safety. Uh, the Roundtree and Blaine Street and Sobering Center are all designed to reduce recidivism and transition offenders back into our community in a positive way. So it's a good thing that despite being very fiscally conservative, um, tripling our reserves, controlling our pension costs, reducing the number of county employees, uh, you have been able to augment county services. So it's a significant achievement. Uh, I will say though that there remain, uh, as you will hear during these budget hearings, that there's still critical unmet needs that the community faces and that we in fact heard from the community during our strategic planning uh, public input process. Um, there's a significant needs in behavioral health and substance use disorder. There's still a great need out in the community and there's the community uh, members that have asked us to do more in this area. There's also significant needs both in capital and in operating in our parks and recreation services. We have some significant uh, capital projects that are underfunded as well as our ongoing operation and recreation services. And then as I mentioned, we still have unmet needs and our deferred maintenance for our facilities. I'd now like to get into the proposed budget. As I mentioned, it's a balanced budget. Um, we have uh, taken into uh, account community feedback uh, that we received in our strategic planning process and this budget includes a uh, new um, funding for homeless services. It includes a new housing planner, includes new services in mental health and behavioral health, substance use disorder, road maintenance, and storm damage repair. Um, 
going into our overall budget. Our budget is, um, it's, a, it's a very big budget, it's a huge responsibility, three quarters, uh, two thirds of a, a billion dollar budget, uh, 77, seven, uh, 177 million dollars. Uh, 519 of that is the general fund, and as I mentioned, we have 2470 uh, positions, and again, we're still below uh, the 20, over 2700 employees we had before the Great Recession. The budget, uh, these are the uh, assumptions on our major tax revenues. Uh, you can see that property tax continues to grow. Um, we're projecting about a 4% increase. Um, the cannabis business tax has some growth, um, which is very uncertain, and you'll be hearing a presentation uh, later on today about cannabis, uh, and they'll get into detail about the cannabis revenues. Sales tax is less than 1%, uh, so sales tax has stagnated. Um, hard to understand exactly what's going on there, but it's not just us, it's statewide. Sales tax is, is somewhat declining. Somewhat um, people believe that it may be some of the online sales that are taking place, uh, but anyway, sales tax is now uh, not really growing at all. Uh, TOT, transmit, the hotel tax, transient occupancy tax continues to seeing strong, uh, see strong growth at 7%. These are our uh, trends in property tax. And uh, it's important to note that a property tax is the most important by far revenue source for our general fund. Uh, it represents 20% of our total general fund, but if our general county revenue is at seven, over 70%. So we're very reliant on the property tax and our general fund, and also that explains why we were hit so hard uh, during the Great Recession when property tax uh, decreased. Uh, sales tax, as you can see, is stagnated over time. And um, uh, however, we continue to see strong growth in hotel tax. Part of this is due to the agreements that we've made with Airbnb and to the inclusion of vacation rentals and uh, to be um, start paying the taxes and, and also the auditing that the Auditor Controller's Office has done as well. I'd like to now get into some uh, more specific uh, overviews. Uh, this is the proposed budget revenues by budget category. And you can see that health and human services continue to be the major um, source of our budget. Uh, these are intergovernmental revenues, um, state and federal uh, funds. Uh, and you can see that our general uh, purpose revenues are about 20% of the overall budget. Uh, this is the overall budget by source. You can see intergovernmental revenues are 43%. Uh, therefore, we continue to be very reliant on federal and state funding. And so any changes at the federal level will have great impact on us. Uh, you can also see that our charges for services, our fees, and our tax revenue, general purpose taxes are almost uh, equivalent at, a, at about a quarter of the budget each. This is um, expenditures by category, and you can see again that health and human services are major 40% of our budget. Um, including um, the land use and community services at a quarter and public safety at almost 20%. This is expenditures by expenditure source. You can see that again, our um, main costs are salaries and benefits, which makes sense. We mainly have people who, who um, do the work and then we do contract with many uh, local providers and that's why a third of our budget is uh, contracted with services and supplies. This is our general fund, which is now uh, $514 million. Um, more than half of the general fund is health and human services. Of the general fund expenditures, 60% uh, is health and human services, and about a quarter is public safety. You can see general government of the general fund expenditures is only 7%. Uh, this is the net county cost, or the proposed uh, general fund contribution um, by supported by revenues that are not attributable to any specific um, use. So if we were a city, um, which we kind of are, this is what this would represent. Um, we're unusual again in this county that 
um, almost half of our population in, in the county lives in the unincorporated area and counts on the county to provide municipal services. So in a very real way, we are the biggest city in the county um, and we are one of the biggest cities in the whole region. With Saline, We're almost the size of Salinas in terms of um, doing municipal services. Now if you look at our budget in terms of <clears throat> what our net county costs, 55% is to public safety, and this would be typical for a city. Most cities' um, general fund is about 60% uh, public safety, and so we're right up there with about 55%. And you can see general government, again, is pretty small, and the Health and Human Services, which is used to leverage federal and state funds, is about 20%. This is uh, the general fund uh, budget gap. This is the general fund that is um, supported by um, fund balance. And you can see that it's significantly been reduced over time from $8 million two years ago to 6.3 this year and we're projecting 5.3 next year. Um, this is a very low number, so it's, I don't think it's any cause of great concern. It's less than, a, it's about a percent of our general fund, which is very small. And this is the amount of budget that we're funding primarily with salary savings and budget reversions. Um, so that's why it's considered, um, those are just by strict budgetary terms considered one-time funds. Um, but nevertheless, we've been good about reducing the amount and, and it overall it's a relatively low number. This is um, our general fund as a whole. Uh, this is our net county costs and uh, just shows the changes by budget category. Um, and you can see that uh, when you look at the changes, uh, the major um, dollars are in public safety and that's been this in net county costs. If you look at net county costs, the biggest growth has been in public safety with over uh, $8 million of growth of increases. And that's just due, and that's normal, that's nothing atypical, that's uh, what we're seeing in public safety all across uh, other jurisdictions. And this also shows that we're using uh, $5.3 million of fund balance, which is, again, uh, salary savings, and budget reversions um, to help balance the budget. This is our reserves history, and I know that um, our auditor controller, treasurer tax collector is gonna go over this in more detail, but you can see that this is something that uh, we should be very proud of and that the board um, has set a goal and we've achieved it. County staffing, um, still below um, Again, where we were before the Great Recession of over 2,700 employees, and that is uh, the growth that we've had since the recession has primarily been in that area of health and human services, which now represents almost half of our employees, and the growth has been mainly in the Affordable Care Act and, um, and drug medical and other uh, behavioral health uh, services. So in summary, uh, we have uh, a budget that is good news, um, we have a balanced budget that we have not had to have any layoffs. You've tripled reserves, you've increased your bond rating, you've held employee um, pension and health benefit, retiree health costs, you've reduced them over time, and you've also kept um, the number of employees below what we were before the Great Recession. Uh, we will be adopting the strategic plan um, at your next meeting, and then we will get right to work on developing a two-year operations plan, which is the very specific projects that will be carrying out the goals in the strategic plan, and then we will be adopting our first two-year budget next fiscal year. Um, during this time period, we'll continue um, to develop two initiatives, continuous process improvement, um, and also performance measurement, and we also, um, one major theme of this budget will be that they, there's still, even though we've augmented our services in key areas, there's still some critical and met needs that uh, this board is gonna be challenged to figure out how do we meet those needs that the community is asking for, that we very clearly were asked for during our strategic planning process. Uh, that concludes my presentation and I'm now um, 
either available for questions or going to turn over to our controller and then you can ask us both questions, however you'd like to proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pazos. We'll bring it over to uh, Ms. Driscoll and then we'll open it up to the board for questions. Good morning, Chair and members of the board. <coughs> Edith Driscoll, Auditor Controller, Treasurer, Tax Collector. As we begin our week of budget hearings, as your controller, I have a few brief remarks to make regarding the county's debt ratings and reserve balances. I'll begin with debt ratings. The county issues both short-term and long-term debt to meet its needs. These two different types of debt are rated by Standard & Poor's and Moody's and are given two different types of ratings. Ratings from Standard & Poor's and Moody's are important to the county. The outcome of the ratings can save or cost the county money when, in the form of higher or lower interest rates when we sell bonds. I welcome these reviews. From a controller's point of view, there are few opportunities for the county to receive an external <coughs> review of its fiscal policies, <coughs> fiscal management, and cash management. The county currently has the highest short-term rating available. Prior to the issuance of our recent TRAN, the county finance team made presentations to these rating agencies. The county once again received the top short-term rating available. The county received SP1 Plus from Standard & Poor's, and MIG-1 from Moody's. That's positive news for us. The county also maintains very strong long-term ratings. When Moody's reviewed our current rating in 2018, as the CAO mentioned, it left it unchanged at AA3. For Moody's, that's the fourth step on its long-term rating. Our long-term rating with Standard & Poor's is AAA. That's the top step of their long-term ratings. The AAA was updated in 2017 from a AA. This reflects the highest rating S&P gives to both our short-term and long-term ratings. Recently, your board approved the issuance of this year's TRAN. TRAN is our tax and revenue anticipation notes for short-term financing. We issued it in the amount of $45 million. I am pleased to report back that on June 13th, we sold these notes at a very favorable rate of 1.45%. Standard & Poor's provided a few comments with their rating that I want to call out to you. They stated, the rating reflects our view of the county's very strong economy, liquidity and debt position, and strong budgetary performance projected over the next few years. Further strength strengthening the ratings is our view of the county's strong management and good fiscal policies. In Moody's ratings report, they provided similar comments, but also spoke to the county's challenges specifically calling out the county's rising pension costs. Looking to our future costs, the proposed budget includes fully funding the county's reserve target of 10%, as the CAO mentioned. Not only are we meeting our reserve goal, but we are meeting it early, and I congratulate you. This reflects your board's dedication to invest in the future through sound fiscal management. <clears throat> I urge you to continue this practice of maintaining spending constraint throughout these budget hearings. Thank you, and this concludes my remarks. Thank you, Ms. Driscoll. Are there questions or comments from uh, board members? Supervisor McPherson. Uh, I'd, I'd like to just uh, recognize that um, the the county, uh, congratulate our, our, our staff uh, throughout the county for um, getting together in some long-term uh, agreements that we have. It gives us stability and predictability of what's in the future and it really helps our budgeting process. So I want to thank the 2,470 employees of county government for uh, coming together and uh, coming to an agreement on that and for the management and what it did to, uh, to bring that together and to uh, applaud to the county administrative officer for this presentation, this proposed budget. It's, it's very understandable, and I, I think it uh, lets people know just exactly where we're at and where, where we're going to be going. Um, and I think that um, we should be recognized that this is a mouthful, but the Government Finance Officers Association of the United States and Canada uh, gave us a Distinguished Budget Presentation Award. Uh, that's not, doesn't come to all county governments. And so the way this is presented and what the position we're in today compared to four or five years ago is to be applauded by everybody. And I especially want to thank the employees for um, seeing what, um, what was ahead of us at the time. Uh, to, re to reach this 10% reserve, uh, I think, what, three years ahead of time is really, really uh, very, very good news. Um, 
also that we, we still have challenges though, as you, you said, uh, as good as this is, we know that there's long-term challenges in our public safety, um, a budgeting process, but especially for healthcare and human services and the homeless issue that we're, we're facing, um, as well as every other of the 57 counties in the state. Um, we have some real uncertainties in the federal government and what it's going to do, and uh, that's, that could have an impact uh, on how we get through this fiscal year. But uh, that aside, I think we're in good position with our reserve and the way we've been managing things through the years. Um, the, um, I was really pleased to see in the, uh, the state budget that it appears that uh, the state is going to allocate or, re or release some, um, some funds again for unfunded mandates, which uh, as a member of the California State Association of Counties, uh, we've been really working on that for the state. Uh, unfunded mandates for that jargon is through the years what the state has uh, told us what the counties, when locals, governments, what to do, but didn't give you the money to carry out the programs. Now they're seeing the light and they gave us some of that, uh, what, three years ago. They have released that in the budget, I think that the governor will sign now. So that is very good news. And I, um, I think that's gonna help us um, a lot. I also want to, uh, uh, really uh, address one one uh, project, the, the solar projects, and uh, really Carol Johnson, who has done so much in leading this, and Supervisor Ryan Coonerty, and, and the whole board, too, about what we have done to offset the uh, utility use by the county government by cut it in half. And that's gonna have long-term positive budget impact for us. And our association with the Monterey Bay Area Community Power um, is going to be another big plus for us. So, in that, that area especially, uh, for um, energy use, reducing our energy and environmental protection in general, um, I wanna congratulate everybody who's <coughs> been a real big part of that. That's been a fantastic thing that we're doing. And really, we're a leader in the state in uh, letting other counties know how this can get done. So um, those are a couple of the um, comments that I really wanted to make. Um, we have a tremendous, um, health and human services, behavioral health uh, challenge ahead of us. Um, the homeless issue is, um, it's everywhere in the state and it's everywhere in this nation. And um, we have to just do what we can do with the cooperation of the state and federal government and our, our, our other local jurisdictions, the four cities in Santa Cruz County. But by and large, I just wanna say thank you to the employees of uh, Santa Cruz County for getting us to where we are and, to, and getting us in the right direction of where we're going to, going to be in the future. It's really good news compared to four or five years ago. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Supervisor Caput. Uh, I want to turn on your. It looks like I want to thank you, and uh, that we're heading in the right direction. Um, I don't have it in front of me, but the uh, okay, the reduced uh, pension obligations. Uh, part of that is due because uh, we're all contributing more towards our pension as percentage-wise than we did, what, about seven, six or seven years ago. W what percentage difference is that, uh, just a ballpark figure? Well, the um, miscel miscellaneous employees now contribute 7% um, towards their uh, retirement. And public safety, I believe it's 12%? 12, yeah. 12. Okay, and, and, and across the board, as far as that yes. we're concerned, uh, what percent is that possibly? Well, 7%, you would be in miscellaneous category and it would be 7% that you're contributing towards your retirement. 7% um, would right. be the miscellaneous group, so that would be uh, the group that the board is in, as well as all miscellaneous employees. Uh, compared to what, uh, uh, six years ago, seven years ago? Three and a half percent, I think we doubled it. Okay, so we doubled it, that's good. And then uh, uh, I read, a lot of us read uh, that the pension obligations are in trouble. Some of that is because of PERS and the way uh, that maybe they uh, invest the money that they put in. 7% growth is supposed to be somewhat sustainable or seven and a half. And uh, so we're, we're tied in with that also, right? That is correct. They had um, reduced their um, 
investment or earnings projections from seven and a half, was actually 7.75 a few years ago, and then they reduced it to 7.5, and now it's at 7%. And so that reduced earning projections has resulted in our costs going up. Uh, luckily, um, the board did a couple of things. One is that we uh, both, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, renegotiated with our labor partners the retiree health benefit uh, formulas, as well as we implemented a second tier of retirement benefit formulas as well, uh, prior to the implementation of the state reforms. So that has reduced our long-term liability significantly. You bet. Okay. <coughs> Uh, does it look like we're going to have to contribute more, uh, maybe a percent or two percent more as far as our contribution to the uh, pension obligations? Well, the, the county's um, proportion uh, will be going up um, for the over the next um, seven years. It will be increasing. And so the county will be contributing more. That's based on um, estimates that PERS has given us. Uh, we are, um, have, not done, have not anticipated anything yet with regard to labor negotiations and changing the formula that we have now. Right, okay. But when you say changing the formula, we're talking about percentages? Percentage of how much uh, employees contribute, right. Okay. So you don't see that going up or do you, we do see it going up a little? Well, that's gonna be uh, part of negotiations in the future that we would, we would then address it. If, if it, right now we don't anticipate that, but it's, that's always possible in the future, but right now we don't anticipate that. Okay, so what I'm getting at is uh, future uh, obligation and sustainability. Somehow if uh, our generation is gonna have to do something to make it better for the next generation coming behind us, All right? Uh, tax revenues uh, uh, are down a little bit. But uh, that is also, uh, we've raised uh, countywide, uh, the, the tax rate has actually gone up, the percentage of tax, right? Overall, our tax uh, revenues are, are increasing. They continue to grow uh, overall, like I think about 4%. Um, it, it's just in sales tax that they have, uh, sales tax is actually um, stagnated but our property tax, right. uh, transient occupancy tax, others continue to grow at a, at a healthy rate. So overall, the tax revenues are up, just the sales tax is stagnated. Right, uh, as far as the sales tax though, uh, we've increased the sales tax, but yet the revenue is a little bit less than it was before, about 1%, right? Uh, we, haven't, we have not increased our sales tax. Our sales tax rate in the county is 8.5% and it stayed the same. So we have not, other, some of the cities around us have increased their sales tax, but we have not. That sales tax, is that tied to the gas tax also? Is that different? It's not tied to it, but we do get sales tax on, on gas. And all that, okay. Um, okay, I wanna thank you. Uh, and uh, I think uh, we still have a lot of work to do to make sure that we can sus uh, sustain our obligations in the future. I don't want to be part of the group that makes it so hard on the future obligations that somehow it collapses, okay? I think we're all concerned with that. Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you both for the presentation. Um, I think you, it, it is uh, great to hear that decisions we've made in the past have had uh, 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 great success uh, here in, uh, in the present. Um, as uh, uh, Mr. Palacios uh, reminded us, we made um, some difficult decisions in collaboration with, the, uh, with all who work here uh, to change um, s some of our pension obligation and our retiree health. That $180 million that we have saved um, helps us with our long-term um, needs here in the county. Uh, the ability of our staff to work harder with less, with less resources um, is a real credit to their abilities. Um, and you know, this budget uh, that, that we're gonna be reviewing over the next couple days doesn't add lots of new people. Um, the fact that we have over less than the 250 em employees less than we did at the start of the Great Recession, uh, I don't see that coming back as part of uh, county government. 
um, we have to get used to it. And just to give some sense, that would be uh, maybe a third of all the employees at the uh, city of Santa Cruz and m maybe, I don't know, half the employees at the city of Watsonville. So the, those are the real people um, uh, who did real work here um, and which we're asking our staff to, to, to uh, shoulder a little bit heavier burden. Um, so I really appreciate the work that all of our, our staff, the county staff, the county family is doing to help meet the needs of people in the community. Um, and I think that this fiscal report uh, which shows that uh, because we've been able to triple the reserves, uh, reduce our pension obligations, and um, and and hold the line on uh, the growth of the organization, uh, to see these credit ratings uh, come in strongly, uh, which means we pay less money when we have to borrow money, uh, I think is very helpful for again for our long-term sustainability. So I want to express my appreciation to the uh, to the management and the staff of the County of Santa Cruz for the great work that they do. So, okay. Please, Mr. Foss, yes. Okay, and uh, in closing, I just wanted to thank all of the county staff who worked on the budget. Uh, it's a very um, significant um, undertaking, and this year we've also um, continued to modify the budget document, which is uh, trying to make it more user-friendly. It's been a significant change, um, and um, so I wanna thank all of the staff um, in each of the departments who work on the budget from the department heads on to the financial staff and other program staff who have worked on the budget. Uh, I think they've done a great job and I uh, in particular wanted to point out Christina Mowry, our budget manager, for her leadership in this area as well as um, Nicole Coburn, our assistant county administrative officer and uh, Melody Serino, our deputy uh, city manager for their work on the budget as well as all the CAO staff. Right. Supervisor Kennedy. Yeah, I just wanna um, add my kudos and then a quick question. Um, do we have a sense as to what our healthcare costs uh, are trending um, in addition to the pension costs everyone talks about, but but how do healthcare costs look? Um, I haven't, looked. do you know, Christina? I'm sorry, I'm not um, aware of that. Yeah, the microphone. Mike. Um, they've been trending higher, just like PERS. Um, we have built an escalator into the budget um, based on our averages. Um, so it ranges anywhere from three to four to five to six percent, depending. Um, so we'll get that information regarding, I know personnel is here today, but we'll be getting those rates uh, for the following year coming up on uh, the next month or so. Okay, great, thanks. Since this was a presentation, it's a non-action item, we still will open it up to the community. If there's anybody I'd like to address us briefly on just the general presentation here, and if not, we will move into the consent agenda items. Okay, seeing none, we will uh, move on to the consent agenda. This is items seven through uh, 21. Is there anybody from the board that would like to either pull or comment on one of these items on consent? Uh, Supervisor McPherson. I'd just like to, um, uh, on the elections office um, situation, I know we're in need of some updates there. I just wanna get a, a general overall, overall picture of um, what are our needs. I know there might be a bond in the state level and so forth for this purpose. I don't know if Gail, uh, our county clerk is here. She might just say, what are our needs? And if that's all right, just to skip to one of those. Because um, I know it's been a pressing problem and it just didn't happen this year. I can remember it was a problem 12 years ago. <laughs> Not for just this county, but throughout. Hello, Gail Pellerin. <laughs> County Clerk, and um, there's some money in the state budget that was approved that would be a shared cost. So the county, we have $100,000 in our budget that's before you today that would be for a lease purchase of a new voting system. So we certainly hope that that would um, happen now that we got the state money. It's not enough money in the state to cover the whole state of California, but it's a good start. Well, I, how about your needs, our, our county's needs? Is it, it'll get us, um, up to where we want to be, or there's, there's going to be additional needs? 
Well, I believe so. Um, we're gonna have a voter advisory committee that we wanna set up for the public and do some strategic planning for what kind of vote system we wanna move toward. That would include either moving toward a vote center model in 2020 or keeping our polling place model. And if we do go vote center, I mean, no matter what, we're gonna need to purchase a new voting system or lease one is what we're looking at doing. And of course, voting systems continue to get certified and approved and you know, we have to see what's out there. So we hope to do our research this summer, working with the public and do some demonstrations and they get their feedback and then hopefully, hopefully enter into a purchase or at least purchase with the company. Okay, well thank you for another safe and accurate uh, voting We're still counting. Tally. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> it's not over until it's over, but yeah. uh, no, it, it's uh, very much recognized and appreciated. I yeah. think p people feel comfortable that who's in office or what passed or failed uh, is the way that people wanted yeah, it, so it thank you very much. It definitely takes an army, and we're very appreciative of our county family that helped us out on election day and all the extra help and full-time staff that we have. It's tremendous work. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other? Uh, actually, Supervisor a Caput, question. Uh, Ms. Pellerin, I wouldn't quite yeah. leave yet because I think he's interested in how many extra votes you're counting right now. But, <laughs> but, uh, uh, please, Mr. Caput. Uh, as far as the uh, staffing of the polling places and all that, I was reading uh, it was difficult to get enough people, I guess. Uh, did we finally get enough people, did it, you know, countywide? We did, um, and again, thanks to our county family, because I had a call on a number of departments to provide us with staff to help us on election day. And um, it, it did work out as um, well. We did have a lot of cancellations at the last minute. June elections are always hard to staff because of that. And we had illnesses and people who were in the hospital at the last minute. So we had a few little crises, um, but we did manage to pull it off thanks to our amazing poll workers in the community and our county family. Uh, years ago, I did uh, work at the uh, polling place, uh, yeah. uh, probably about 15 years ago, and it was a wonderful experience. I uh, mm -hmm. just wanted to make that clear to people out there that, you know, it's it's a great thing to do. Yeah, so. it, we definitely appreciate the community service. And I think if we move to a vote center model, where we have uh, everybody gets a ballot by mail, and then we set up these vote centers 10 days prior to the election, and we increase the number for the four days prior to the election, we would staff those with more extra help, fully trained staff who would be out in those polling sites and it would be a little more consistent versus what we're doing now because we're recruiting people up until um, 6 a.m. election morning. So, yeah. Thank you, thanks a lot. Uh, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, you know, uh, when we changed our budget hearing process to go through so many uh, uh, budgets, on consent, uh, we missed the opportunity to hear from each of the departments. I appreciate that the, uh, that uh, everyone was able to answer many questions that our office had um, uh, about aspects of the budget. Um, there's a lot of incredible work that gets, uh, that gets approved uh, here uh, with just a simple vote and it doesn't reflect the hours of work that you put into pr preparing your budget documents and of course the hours of work that you do uh, performing all these tasks. There are a couple of departments that I just wanted to um, uh, just say a little bit extra about. Um, the CAO's office um, has been uh, uh, has been very helpful on a number of different pieces, but I just wanna uh, point out that uh, Ms. Coburn and uh, uh, has been very involved in the, the uh, Justice and Gender Task Force, which has been very, very helpful, uh, along with Mr. Stafford. Uh, and I really appreciate their work, and there will be a presentation to our board in December about that work, uh, but we're making some good progress there. Uh, the Office of Economic Development has been very helpful in working with businesses in my district. Um, and they've been very good about communicating with me about uh, different issues and I really appreciate that and their ongoing advocacy for especially for small business here in Santa Cruz. Um, County Council's office, uh, we depend on them uh, so thoroughly uh, um, for their expertise. Um, uh, you know, when uh, someone doesn't agree with us, they always say, well, you don't have to listen to your lawyer. But I've found that when we actually listen that we actually <laughs> It actually serves us well, and I appreciate the work that you and your staff do all, all the time. Um, our information services department is uh, is a, a incredibly uh, critical uh, part of uh, county 
uh, government. It's the way in which most people interact with the county these days uh, is they go to our websites uh, and they use our uh, apps and everything else. I just want to appreciate uh, them. And even those days where I yell at my computer because it's taking too long uh, to access the internet, um, I won't take your name in vain, but, uh, but I just appreciate the work to keep that system going and making sure that we're not uh, attacked every day by, um, by different viruses. Um, uh, the General Services Department has been, uh, as was mentioned earlier in uh, doing the, all the solar panels uh, on the county facilities, that was a huge undertaking this year. Uh, I also want to recognize that they've added to our electric car charging uh, network, which I think is uh, very important as we try to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and ensure that we have uh, the infrastructure to be able to support people who are helping make those uh, changes. Uh, lastly, the personnel department uh, was very helpful uh, to this board last year in the selection of our new CAO um, and continues to be very helpful um, in providing expertise and help, and help with other recruitments that are going on that the, are the responsibilities of, uh, of county government but don't actually fall in the county family. So thank you, Ajita, for your help in, uh, in, with some of those other recruitments as well. Your experience is greatly appreciated. And with that. Uh, Supervisor McPherson, you had another comment to make? Yeah, I'm, um, I wanted about economic development, and I don't know if Mr. Constable could uh, answer this, but uh, we had a sales ta uh, tax, um, leveling out, I guess you'd call it, uh, as is in the state. We have plenty of projects going on here. Uh, do you have um, any estimate of if some of these things come out on uh, or how many jobs might be added in this county? Uh, I doubt that you could say, well, this would have an in this impact on sales tax revenue, but uh, just where we're at, we're, you're ver being very active and proactive, and I appreciate that uh, and throughout the county. Appreciate that. Um, we don't actually have hard numbers as yet. Um, until we get the projects, I think, closer to the finish line, we won't be able to really make a uh, accurate number count as far as the job generation and, and also sales tax. And just to kind of address one thing, the sales tax decline, I think, is, as Carlos mentioned, a uh, indication of two things. One is the ever-changing kind of persnickety nature of the consumer. Uh, which has gone directly towards online sales as an alternative. And the other is there is a wholesale change that's occurring within the retail industry that is kind of fleshing out what not only the consumer wants, but also what is sustainable on a longer term basis. Because a lot of the retailers have gone through a major expansions mm -hmm. and now they're looking at, hey, is this really serving our customers? It's not, so they're pulling back. Thank you. Thanks for getting persnickety into the budget discussion, too. <laughs> Two points. Uh, Supervisor Coonerty, did you have something to add on this? No, okay. um, I'll just briefly add a few things on uh, personnel. I just wanted to thank your work on the employee wellness program. I know it's also uh, done in conjunction with health, uh, but it's something that Supervisor Leopold and I had brought forward a couple of years ago, um, and I think it really does bring a lot uh, for the employees, so I appreciate that as well as the uh, leadership and training academies that you've been doing. We've received a lot of feedback that employees are appreciating that and to the degree that those can be expanded. They are very little cost but offer a lot to maintain that um, the high quality employees that we have. As, as uh, was noted by Mr. Palacios, we may not be necessarily hiring more people, but the one thing we definitely want to do is retain our top talent and anything that we can do to ensure that people uh, can stay here. And we recognize it's one of the highest costs of living in the United States and it's not the only reason why people are here is the pay, but there are other things that we can do for them on the training side and the employee wellness side to ensure that they're here. And so uh, please do continue that work in any way that it can be expanded, we appreciate. Uh, in regards to information technology, uh, uh, we receive a lot of positive feedback on the mobile app and we appreciate the work of your staff on that. Obviously anything we can do as an entire county family to ensure that we're as responsive as possible department by department to those requests that come through, uh, the app would be great. Uh, in any way that it can be expanded to even more online services uh, as the world moves. That is definitely the way that people would like to be able to interact with our government. As Supervisor Leopold did note, one thing I don't think people really do realize is that uh, all government sites and services are constantly under a barrage and attack from an information technology and security standpoint. And our small but mighty team there 
uh, has done an amazing job keeping those sites up. And I blame net neutrality, not them, and the slowness of the websites, at least effective last Monday, but I, <laughs> but I appreciate uh, uh, the work that, that your entire team does as we sit here in the shadow of the Silicon Valley, and we know that it's tough to retain talent, especially within your field. You really have put together a great uh, collection of people. Translating that over also to county council, uh, you have put together an outstanding team. It's difficult to recruit mid-level people, especially in this world with these kinds of costs, but uh, you have people that I think uh, are committed not just to the law, but to the community in a way that's very unique, and I think that that's a great reflection of your management and leadership style in that department, so I appreciate uh, your work on that. Uh, we now open it up to all of you. If, if any of you would like, either like to pull an item or come up to speak about any of these departments, now would be your opportunity. Good morning, welcome. Thank you for waiting. Good morning. My name is Olivia Martinez. I'm the SAU staff representative for the county. Um, I want to thank you for mentioning labor as part of the to help the county with its budgets. I really appreciate that acknowledgement. My only concern and something that I'm asking the board and the CEO is to consider hiring more facility maintenance workers, um, either limited term or permanent. Um, there's currently 10 for 64 buildings that they have to maintain. I just found that found about that two weeks ago, so I thought it was important for you guys to know that they're very short staff. But besides that, I enjoy working with personnel in all the departments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else like to address us on any of these items? Okay, seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board for action on the consent agenda. Move the recommended action. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Coonerty, a second from Supervisor Caput. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Thank you all for your amazing work on this. We'll move on to uh, oral communications. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us on items that are not on today's agenda but within the purview of the Board of Supervisors. Anybody like to address us on this, on anything? Okay. Seeing none, we will open up the regular agenda. We have item 22, which is to consider the 2018-19 proposed budget for the Cannabis Licensing Office, including any supplemental budget materials as provided in the reference budget documents. We have uh, the proposed budget, the line item detail, the supplemental budget, the supplemental budget schedules A, A1, A2, A3, the supplemental, uh, the unified fee schedule supplemental budget, and uh, the errata as well. We have a presentation. I would appreciate you guys waiting. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. We're going to tag team you this morning. Um, I'm Melody Serino, Deputy County Administrative Officer, and of course, Robin Bolster Grant, our Cannabis Licensing Manager. And we're going to present our uh, budget briefly and, of course, answer any questions that you may have. So uh, first, I want to just give you a quick review of the current fiscal year. Um, as you can see, while we've saved money in our expenses, primarily due to staff vacancies, we did not meet our fee revenue projections, and general fund dollars will be needed to fill this gap. When the 2017-18 budget was um, made, three assumptions were made in building that budget. Um, that there would be a registration process for manufacturers, similar to the one that we did for cultivators. That we would be issuing licenses for cultivators and manufacturers by March of this year. And that approximately 10% of the licensees would require more than one inspection. So the revenues were not realized because it was determined that the registration process for the manufacturers would interfere with the then in process uh, environmental impact study by changing the baseline data so we did not um, go forward with that process. Um, in addition, the licensing process, as you know, um, was not approved until May and we just started um, opening the licensing process about a week ago. Um, so the collection of any potential licensing revenues that we had projected for earlier did not, uh, were not realized. Um, and um, however, we did want to say that the some of the licensing revenue was replaced by um, pre-inspections, um, pre-licensing inspections that we did. So we did we were able to um, support some of that additional revenue. So we highlighted our goals and accomplishments from this last fiscal year in our cover letter, and we will present them briefly again here for the public. Uh, it has been a busy and I think productive year for our office. 
Uh, one important goal was to complete the pre-license inspections that Melody mentioned uh, for all um, the non-anonymous uh, registered cultivators. Um, as you can see, we went out to nearly 100 sites around the county performing these inspections, and these really gave us a sense of what the cultivation process looked like on the ground, uh, and the inspections and our subsequent feedback also helped prepare these cultivators for what the licensing process would look like. In many cases, this was their introduction to regulation, um, so that was important. Um, the inspections also helped to inform uh, the uh, EIR, uh, which was completed. Um, while it was not formally certified, the EIR did give us a framework for the licensing and permitting process and was incorporated into the ordinance adopted by your board on May 8th. Um, we also successfully licensed all 12 of our dispensaries and completed the renewal and inspection process. With the passage of the ordinance, the main focus of our work going forward shifts to implementation and enforcement. Uh, once the non-retail commercial cannabis ordinances became effective, we began soliciting pre-application appointments to begin the actual licensing and permitting process. We created a module in the Hansen software platform used by the planning department for tracking and reporting all cannabis activities. Hansen allows us to link licenses, permits, and enforcement action, and the information is also accessible through our GIS mapping system. In keeping with the goals of the community, uh, of community outreach and education, we have conducted eight workshops to align the regulatory environment with our community goals and values. In addition to helping the industry develop best practices, we have honored our commitment to the community regarding enforcement, responding to more than 35 complaints over the past year. We also wanted to give you just a quick update on cannabis business taxes. Um, though these funds, of course, go directly to the general fund and support a variety of community needs, we want you to be aware of their contribution. So we started collecting taxes in 1415 from the dispensaries, and that year brought in about $978,000. Um, in 1516, that number increased to about 2.5 million, and it's pretty much held steady at about that um, for the last uh, few years. Um, in 2016-17, we also began to collect taxes from the non-retail cannabis business, um, and um, so we've so far this year received about a total of about 2.8 million um, dollars from the cannabis business taxes. We've projected uh, a larger percent, 4.4 uh, million for the upcoming fiscal year, and we believe that that represents a full licensing process. As you can see, most of the growth is going to come from the non-retail sector. So this is our uh, budget overview uh, for this fiscal year. So you can see um, that our budget has doubled. Um, and while we will not increase the staff in the cannabis licensing office, this cr increase includes funding for six new positions across three other departments, planning, the sheriff's office, and the district attorney's office. The purchase of additional vehicles and other sorts of equipment is also included. The six new positions are intended um, primarily to uh, beef up our enforcement capabilities, um, and then of course to prepare for the development side of the cannabis licensing process um, that the planning department will have to, have, will have to handle. Um, several one-time expenses such as infrastructure setup costs are also included in this budget. Revenue assumptions are based on a new fee structure which is primarily at cost fees for most licensing activities. We will maintain flat fees for the dispensary renewal licenses and the pre-application appointments. And the revenue assumptions anticipate about 225 licenses being issued in the new fiscal year. So the work of the Cannabis Licensing Office in the upcoming fiscal year will be primarily focused on licensing and enforcement efforts. This will inevitably include a substantial amount of outreach and educational efforts, both for the industry and the general public. Within the next few months, we expect to conduct six to eight outreach events to assist with folks, uh, their understanding of our licensing program and the steps that are required to obtain a license. Uh, we have already begun our licensing appointments with some of those in the industry who completed the pre-inspections or pre-licensing inspections. Uh, we've also been working closely with the Sheriff's Office to prepare for enhanced enforcement efforts. We've obtained space here at 701 Ocean, and the uh, Sheriff anticipates staff, uh, staff will be on board by August 1st. 
Cannabis licensing and sheriff staff will be in constant communication to assist in transition for our registrants and to help eliminate unlicensed activity. As requested by the board at an earlier meeting, we are to return annually at budget hearings with a detailed annual report, including data on a, ver a variety of performance measures regarding licensing, enforcement, and compliance issues. The cannabis licensing staff has demonstrated their commitment, professionalism, and their ability to respond to community needs and concerns this year. Uh, we have no doubt they will continue to perform at exceptional levels in the upcoming year, and we would like to acknowledge their hard work and dedication and thank them for a job well done. That concludes our presentation. Uh, we're happy to answer any questions, and we request that you approve the proposed budget for the Cannabis Licensing Office, including any supplemental materials as recommended by the County Administrative Officer. Thanks thank you for the presentation. Supervisor Coonerty? Yeah, thank you for your work. It's been, uh, I know you're sort of charting new, new ground and uh, doing it both, uh, both well and strategically has been appreciated. Can you give me a sense as to what you're seeing in our local market, um, we're seeing reports around the state and other states of a glut, um, which is causing prices to fall, uh, and um, that on one hand could reduce the number of potential grows, and on the other hand, it could also reduce the amount of uh, tax we collect um, if the prices fall. So what are you seeing locally uh, in this regard? Anecdotally. And then what do you expect? Okay. That's, that trend uh, definitely uh, has been something we've been hearing about um, from all sectors of the industry, that there is uh, a lot more cannabis uh, than is being consumed. That's been true, I think, um, data has shown for quite some time. Um, but with the, the drop in, in the cost um, th that's shifting things, so that, the, but there's also, uh, there, there are numerous shifts as folks um, sort of get their arms around uh, the, the regulations that are being imposed on them. I'm not sure that we can tell where the industry is going to end up. I think that we're seeing a growth in manufacturing um, and to some extent, I guess, distribution, although um, a lot of this is transitional. So I, it's hard to say where it's gonna end up, but certainly the price uh, of cannabis has gone down statewide and in other states where it's been legalized. Um, so we anticipate that there might be some stagnation um, with uh, the cultivation, um, but again, possibly making up for that in terms of manufacturing. We have some interesting folks making some interesting things. Yeah, so I guess the follow-up question that is, Presumably, if the price falls, that reduces the black market um, production because it's just not worth as much anymore. Um, and do, are we seeing um, less grows, less complaints, less calls? Fewer complaints than I anticipated, for sure. And anecdotally, and this comes from folks who sell hydroponic gear and such, that they, they have seen a drop off in, in purchases of equipment, um, particularly in some of the outlying areas, some of the, the, the mountain areas. So this could reflect a shift of folks coming out of the mountains, which is something we've been talking about for a long time, um, into uh, the, the CA land in South County. And so maybe it's, again, it's just sort of a, a, a settling out. Um, not everybody is going to want to stick around um, if the price continues to fall, it won't, it won't be worth it for everyone. And then this team, and this is probably not for you to answer, but I mean, the team we're setting up to do enforcement um, presumably can be some, occasionally people just don't grow and go away. Occasionally people shift to other drugs that are even more dangerous uh, and destructive uh, and whether this team will be able to be deployed against meth houses and other, other sorts of impactful activity. So I, I can answer that. The sure. um, Sheriff's Office, the team, Frank Gambus's team that has um, been kind of the drug enforcement team is not going away. We're simply supplementing these additional two deputies to work specifically for um, cannabis activities. But the Sheriff's other team that works on drug enforcement activities will continue to operate. Okay. Thank you. Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation. 
Um, you, you have a, both a really interesting job and a very difficult one because trying to forecast what the future hold has proven to be somewhat elusive, uh, not through bad planning on our part or, or lack of effort, it's just that this is a very fast evolving uh, industry and uh, trying to keep up with it is, uh, I can imagine, could be challenging. I have, uh, in the conversations I've had with people in the industry, they've appreciated the Cannabis Licensing Office, the, um, the support that they've got and the ability to answer questions, the sort of straightforward nature of what they hear, uh, which I think is very helpful and is, establishes a trust necessary to get people to come in um, and uh, become legal. In your presentation, you, uh, uh, in the, the second to last slide, uh, you uh, pointed out to 150 cultivation licenses and 75 manu uh, or, distribute or manufacturing licenses. Uh, given that we had 750 uh, registrants, um, uh, what is, this? you know, that's, that there's a big difference there. So uh, what might, uh, people expect and what would, should we expect to hear in the next year about that? Uh, so the reason that we um, picked those numbers is that because this is the transition year where people have to really get used to what it means and all of the forms they're going to have to file and all of the pieces of paper they're going to have to do and we really were trying to um, base our budget on a small num a fraction of people getting through the entire process. We anticipate in future years that that will you know, speed up. But this first year, we, we figured there's going to be a lot of outreach and education, and so we wanted to make sure that the budget projections were somewhat, <laughs> as, best can, as best could be, uh, you know, uh, assumed uh, in, in a, the world of reality. Um, and uh, we recently had sort of our first deadline of people coming in to file paperwork uh, was either last Friday or the Friday before when the ordinance went into effect. And so out of those 750, were, ha, has that number shrunk? Um, it, it, did, it did shrink a little. About 100 people did, uh, who were an anonymous um, did not manage to meet the deadline. Um, a number, I would say about 10% of those people formally withdrew um, from the process, either because they've decided to do something else or move out of the county. Um, and so we, but we had about 100 people who did not m manage to transition from anonymous to non-anonymous. So that 600, so there's still about 650 uh, registrants that are out there. Yes. Um, and, uh, and so they're gonna, I would imagine that a bunch of them are gonna all come in at the same time uh, uh, trying to get their uh, licensure, uh, right, uh, with the, the state <laughs> or local one, you know, how does, they would like to, yeah. <laughs> for sure. There, there's still, again, the, the, the theme of transition. Um, many of the registrants are on properties that don't comply with, so they will need some time to co-locate, and we're seeing a lot of interest in the co-location. Um, so, so folks are, to some degree, still on the move. Um, the regulations are daunting for a lot of folks. And again, given that the, the, these folks have not had to go through anything like this for the most part, um, it's not, I don't see a huge, you know, wave of folks. It, I think it's a, a trickle that will start to pick up as, um, as information gets disseminated and they get better prepared for what this looks like. Yeah, well, uh, uh, I'll be curious as how this all uh, works out. Um, there's a book to be written about the, our uh, um, uh, cannabis experience. <laughs> um, in terms of the additional items on the budget, I support uh, the inclusion of these n new pieces. I think it's important to have a robust um, uh, enforcement process uh, for everyone involved uh, and for the environment and uh, for neighborhoods and for those who are seeking licensure, um, all those reasons that make sense. Um, the, uh, but with new staff coming on August 1st, what's gonna be, are, are we gonna try to signal to people that, that, that while it's been relatively quiet so far that we are gonna be upping that enforcement? And I think it's, it, I think it's to our benefit uh, to let people know that it's happening because we want them to go away on their own. <laughs> um, uh, but, 
but it shouldn't it shouldn't be a surprise that we're doing it. I agree. And uh, do you have a, a a strategy for outreach to let people know that this is coming? Yes. So um, first off, there'll be um, the next phase of the process for all the people who made it to the non-anonymous um, will be for them to inform us where they're currently cultivating, so that we. Um, can make sure that when we get complaints, we can check it against our database and say, okay, this is somebody who's a registrant, they're currently cultivating, we're not, you know, we'll respond to the complaint, but we're not gonna do an enforcement activity against them. And then, of course, as Robin mentioned, in the next um, month, we're going to be doing several outreach workshops where we will be informing people. And of course, we'll work with all the groups that we have been working with, um, Green Trade especially, um, who's really good about getting the work, word out about these kinds of things. Great, well, I just encourage that outreach to happen. I think it, it has proven to be very successful over time uh, on this issue. Um, in terms of these uh, items in the unified fee schedule, um, you know, uh, this is gonna be the first year in which we're gonna do renewals for dispensaries. Uh, right. No, actually we renewed them in 2000, for 2018. Okay, so, um, so the, the, but we're raising the fees for renewals with no changes, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to get a sense of what that, uh, a renewal with no, uh, no changes, does that mean not a change in ownership? That's or correct. Location? So no change in ownership, no change in anything that they're doing with their businesses. Um, absolutely nothing changed. Uh, 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 product selection uh, wouldn't fall into that category, or would it? It would not. Okay. Um, and then um, this uh, question about, um, or this fee, for local authorization letters of $800. Could you say a little bit more about what that is and why it's, why that costs that? So the local authorization letters came about um, after January 1st and when the state um, enacted their licensing program. Um, a lot of our businesses were in a precarious position where they could not sell their product without having a license. We obviously didn't have a licensing program for the first six months. So the local authorization letters were simply a statement of facts that we could give to folks. They could then turn that into the state and get a temporary license. But we didn't want to give those letters out without at least having a health and safety inspection of the facilities that we were giving this sort of authorization. Um, so um, we uh, have given out, um, I think, well, given out, um, provided um, 110 or so letters that allowed existing businesses to, to stay in business and keep functioning and sell their product. Well, I think that's, I think that's helpful, and um, uh, at least for people in the industry that I've talked to, I've appreciated they've been able to get the letters. Um, I, I haven't talked to anybody about knowing this now, it's gonna cost $800, where before it was, didn't cost anything. No, no, it's, it's been $800. Oh, it's been yes, $800. It has, yes, that's oh, okay. just, yeah, that didn't change. One less call I'll receive. <laughs> anyway, thank you for the ongoing work. I'm sure um, this will be a big year in trying to uh, forecast what the future looks like here in Santa Cruz County um, uh, and what kind of taxes we might expect and what kind of enforcement we're gonna see. Uh, so I wish you good luck in the coming year. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Supervisor Caput. Uh, yeah, I, I quickly wanna uh, thank you for the work you're putting in this and also uh, that the, uh, you know, the revenue that it's gonna bring in is important, of course, but the actual enforcement is gonna be a key to what I consider very important, and that's protecting our environment. Um, it's an interesting fact that uh, a lot of people, including myself before, I considered like the uh, rainforest being the biggest and uh, most important ecosystem in the world. Uh, but actually we're living in part of it right here. Bigger than the Amazon uh, and bigger than the uh, rainforest is the uh, uh, small area where redwood uh, trees grow and that's uh, part of California and a southern part of Oregon. Uh, they actually clean the air, take out carbon and you know produce uh, more oxygen and whatever uh, than anywhere else in the world. And that's, uh, we're, we're stewards of that, we have to protect that. And uh, the way it was going before, uh, I've seen the destruction and I think all of us have in our areas. Uh, 
that was totally unacceptable and that's gonna be a key part of this. I'm hoping that that is a major improvement on the on way things were going when uh, cannabis uh, marijuana was uh, illegal. So, and technically it is illegal federally, but uh, statewide, uh, you know. So thank you, and uh, I just want you to know my biggest concern is using that money to protect our environment. Thank you. Supervisor McPherson. Hi, a couple of things, and they're related to uh, the state as well. Um, one is um, uh, on those products for medical assistance, the state had to approve that, and it's my understanding they did not do that this legislative session to give them a tax exemption in essence. Did you? Is that, is that the way, uh, that's the way I've, I've heard They're it, I don't know. exempt from sales tax, medical, uh, sales to medical patients are currently exempt from sales tax. Mm -hmm. I believe there's a, another bill pending that may um, open up a compassionate use license that is broader than that. I'm not sure the status of that bill yeah, right now. Yeah, okay. Um, and then on taxes in general, um, the state was going to try to lower, or was, there was a bill to lower that from 15, I think, to 11, and that didn't happen. Uh, some other states have lowered their tax structure. Um, do, is there any um, impact or any feedback from those states? I think Washington and Colorado in particular, maybe uh, Oregon too, but that um, when they did that, it, it resulted in that much less revenue or did they say, did more people get into the program or is there, was there any impact on that to date? It's pretty recent, I know, but. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that there's data. Um, I, if there is, I'm, I'm not aware of, of the actual impact of, of lowering taxes in terms of um, revenue, in terms of how many folks, uh, you know, stayed in or got into the licensed uh, universe. Um, I'm just not yeah, sure okay. at this point. Thank you. Well, now I'll open it up to the community. Is there anybody who'd like to address us on this budget item? Uh, seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board for consideration. I would move the recommended actions for the Cannabis Licensing Office. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Leopold, a second from Supervisor Coonerty. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Thank you both for that. Uh, the board will recess until 7 o'clock. We have a zone, of, a zone 7 board of directors meeting in Watsonville at the Watsonville City Council Chambers. Then we will continue to a 7.30 item for continued budget hearings at the Watsonville City Council Chambers. See you tonight. <laughs>